Hi everyone, um, online and here. <laughs> yeah, uh, warm greetings to audience on the other parts of the globe, and a good afternoon to everyone here in Alpha Time Zone. We feel very happy having Dr. Teresa Kanepa here as our last speaker for the Wednesday lecture series for the exhibition Enchanting Expeditions Chinese Trade Porcelains Across the Globe, now at the Art Museum, COHK. And firstly, please let me allow, uh, please allow me to introduce Dr. Teresa Kanepa. Dr. Teresa Kanepa is an independent researcher and lex lecturer in Chinese and Japanese export art, a member of the Council of the Oriental Ceramics Society, the OCS London, and co-editor of the OCS newsletter since 2017. She completed a PhD in art history at Leiden University, the Netherlands, and is author of Silk, Porcelain, and Lacquer, China and Japan and their trade with Western Europe and the New World, 1500 to uh, 1644, published in 2016. And the book, Jing Dozhen to the World, the Lu Collection of Chinese Export Porcelain from the late Ming Dynasty published in 2019 and co-author of the newly published book, Leaping the Dragon Gate, the Sir ba Michael Butler Collection of 17th century Chinese porcelain. Dr. Teresa Kanapa has published a number of articles and lectured, and lectured widely on these subjects. And today, she will deliver a lecture entitled Jing De Jin to the World, Chinese Export Porcelain from the Late Ming Dynasty. Please join me to welcome Dr. Kanepa. We have more audience here alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Wang, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon. I am delighted and honored to be invited to participate in this lecture series. This lecture presents a brief introduction and a discussion on the main types of late Ming export porcelain produced in Jindajan, a town situated in the northeast of Jiangxi province. It is based on a recent study of the Lurie collection of late Ming export porcelain comprising about 100 pieces that are exceptional not only for their aesthetic beauty and quality, but also for their historical importance and includes information from my PhD dissertation, Silk, Porcelain and Lacquer for Leiden University in the Netherlands, published as a book in 2016. And from my most recent publication, the book Leaping the Dragon Gate, published in November of this year, which I co-authored with Catherine Butler, daughter of the distinguished British diplomat and porcelain collector, Sir Michael Butler. In the late Ming Dynasty, a complex of imperial kings produced porcelain of the highest quality exclusively for the emperor and his court in Beijing. Seen on this map, published in, Fu in the Fuliang County Gazetteer in the 21st year of the Kanji reign of the subsequent Qing Dynasty corresponding to 1682. In the early years of the reign of Emperor Wanli, which lasted from 1573 to 1620, the demands for the court for high quality porcelain were so great that it was often impossible to fulfill orders at the imperial kilns. The shortfall had to be made up by purchases from privately owned kilns located in and around Jinjitin, which produced for porcelain for both the domestic and export markets. This system called order by the government, fired by the people, had already taken place in the previous reign of judging. Poorly commercial and loosely organized, the private kilns, which by 1600 number around 300, had a much larger capacity. A variety of porcelains for the export market were produced at the private kilns in the last reigns of the Ming Dynasty before it came to an end in 1644 including a new style of porcelain known as crack, the so-called transitional and kosometsuke made for the Japanese market. It was a period of political and economic turmoil, of social upheaval and of foreign trade. 
the imperial kilns went into decline. And after the potters expressed their grievances with the riots in 1601 and 1604, the kilns ceased production in 1608. The best potters and porcelain painters had to seek employment at the private kilns, bringing with them the technical expertise and high quality raw materials formerly monopolized by the imperial kilns. They were now free from strict official constraints and thus gave free reign to their creativity and innovative skills to satisfy the demands of the domestic market. Moreover, they show a readiness to respond to the varying demands of the expanding foreign markets. Many private kilns that we will see in the next few minutes develop new shapes and decorative styles. A selection of pieces from the Lurie and Butler collections, some of them unique or extremely rare, and thus more difficult to date precisely, and others recovered from the Hatcher junk that sunk in circa 1643, have been studied and compared stylistically to extant porcelains in public and private collections, as well as to excavated shards that originally formed part of similar pieces whenever possible, establishing direct links to the Jinjingan kilns where such pieces were fired. This would not have been possible without the generosity of my colleagues in Jinjingan and other parts of the world. The pieces are organized in five sections arranged chronologically by type to illustrate how the shapes and decorative styles evolve from one reign to the next. The variety of shapes, as well as the beauty and outstanding quality of many pieces, give tangible evidence of what the potters and painters were able to achieve in this period. Some of them reflect influences of both East and West. Multiple sources of evidence, textual material and visuals shed light on the trading networks through which these Jinjigen export porcelain circulated throughout the world, as well as the way in which they were acquired and used in, by different societies in Europe, the New World, Asia and the Middle East. The earliest pieces are made in a new style of export porcelain commonly known in the West as crack which probably began to be produced at the end of the reign of Emperor Longqing, which lasted only six years from 1567 to 1572. The development of the new porcelain style was most likely prompted by the emperor's partial lifting of the ban on Marathan trade issued in the early Ming, which from 1567 allowed licensed private trade with any country except for Japan from the port of Yuegan in Jiangxi of Fujian province. Thus, private trade thrived and prompted a soaring demand for porcelain overseas. It's important in the history of porcelain production at Jinjigen during the late Ming Dynasty is undeniable. It was produced in vast quantities almost exclusively for export until the end of the Chongjin reign. Fired at the very least in 13 private kilns alongside porcelain for the domestic market, cracked porcelain was the first type of gingergen porcelain to be exported all over the world. Recent archaeological finds at the Luma Kiao kiln, which was an important producer of high quality porcelain in the late Ming dynasty, have revealed that cracked porcelain was also fired there. It seems likely that the opening of the Spanish Trans-Pacific Trade Route in 1565, with galleons traversing annually from Cebu and after 1571 from Manila to the port of Acapulco, located in the west coast of New Spain, with exceedingly large cargoes of porcelain to the New World market, could also have contributed to the development of cracked porcelain. The wide range of shapes and distinctive decorative styles that appear over the 70 or so years of production were adapted to the taste and specific demands of the many distinctive customers in Europe, the New World, Japan, Turkey, Iran, and Southeast Asia. The majority of crack porcelain was decorated in underglaze cobalt blue in a free and spontaneous style. The quality of the cobalt blue varied considerably, ranging from a brilliant deep blue to pale silvery and to gray shades. Most pieces were made with poorly levigated clay, which sometimes resulted in impurities bursting through the glaze and the piece warping or cracking. 
The potters use a glaze that did not adhere well to the body and thus it often burst open at the edges of rims during firing. Grid from the kiln adhered to the bases and foot rings as the potters placed the pieces directly onto a thin layer of sand to prevent the molten glaze from sticking. The crack production also included a small quantity decorated solely in polychrome overglazed enamels or in a combination of underglazed blue and overglazed enamels. The latter may have been fired at the wine and or third middle school kins, where shards decorated in underglazed blue and overglazed enamels have been excavated. In addition, as we will see later on, some pieces showed a combination of underglazed blue and red. As you probably know, only a few pieces of these types have been recorded. One of the most distinctive characteristics of cracked porcelain was the decoration arranged in panels, by which it is generally recognized. The fact that a small number of crack pieces of extraordinary high quality were produced reflects the involvement of high skilled potters in the work of certain private kilns. Their thinness, well-defined molding and finely executed decoration is truly exceptional. The great variety of shapes and decorative styles encourage us to reconsider the overall production of crack porcelain and the requirements of the customers of such pieces. This saucer dish is one of the earliest crack pieces in the Lurie collection. It is extremely rare to find a spider's web as a decorative motif in crack porcelain. Unrelated scene with spider's web is found on a crack plate in the Topkapi Sarai Palace in Istanbul. The panel border of lotus sprays and Buddhist suspicious emblems is known with minor variations on a small number of crack pieces. For instance, it is found on four large dishes in the Topkapi Sarai Palace and on the size of a bowl fitted with silver gilt mounts dating to circa 1585 in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The saucer dish can be dated by comparison to fragments found on the coast of Baja California, where a Spanish galleon was shipwrecked in the late 1570s. A fragment excavated in Acapulco proves that cracked saucer dishes of this type were important into the Spanish colonies in the world. An unusual feature of this saucer dish is the double ring painted on the base. There are also a few cracked dishes recorded with high quality molding and painted decoration, but of slightly later date, circa 1590-1610, which have a double ring near the foot ring. The Lurie collection includes two such dish dishes, one of them illustrated here. The next piece is a saucer dish molded with ten radiating panels and finely painted in silvery shades of cobalt blue. Intact pieces and archaeological finds demonstrate that such dishes were imported into both the Middle East and Europe. Saucer dishes of this shape and decoration were also produced combining underglazed blue and overglazed enamels, as evidenced by a shard excavated at the third middle school kiln site. Dating to circa 1580-1590, this dish is one of the few crack dishes of the cagonal shape known. These include an example of the same size that was formerly in the Adeli shrine in Iran and six others in the Topkapi Sarai Palace. The private kilns also produce a small number of crack dishes with polygonal or octagonal rims of smaller size. A shard of such an octagonal dish was excavated at the Dajanon kiln site. Therefore, it seems reasonable to believe that at least some of these octagonal, decagonal and polygonal dishes were fired on this kiln and that they were intended for the Middle Eastern market. A few pictorial marks have been reported in crack porcelain. The egret is the rarest mark. It is known exclusively on crack plates, saucer dishes, and more rarely on klapmutzen, and also on a few trade saucer dishes of small size. These pieces of about 260 are usually of exceptionally high quality, finely decorated in deep shapes of cobalt blue. The mark shows three different variants. The fact that no pieces with this mark have been excavated at Jindijen makes it impossible to ascertain if they were fired in only one kiln or in different kilns, and in the latter case, if the production was simultaneous. 
Considering the archaeological finds of high quality crack and trade porcelain made on Wainga and Shibakiao kiln sites, it seems possible that at least the best quality pieces there in this mark could have been fired in these kilns. Thus far, this fragment of a crack Kravmuts is the only archaeological find of porcelain bearing an Ekren mark. Excavated in Macau, the Portuguese trading post established in 1557 improved that the Portuguese acquired porcelain with the Ekren mark. Other tangible evidence is provided by a saucer dish bearing an Ekren mark found among the porcelain that covers the pyramidal ceiling in a small drawing room in the former Santos Palace, now the French embassy in Lisbon. Decorated with a naturalistic scene, it shows the first variant of the egret, with an erect body with serrated feathers, a straight neck, a thin open beak, and long legs terminated in two circles representing its feet. In the second variant, the egret has a haunch body, a closed beak pointing downwards, and shorter legs with no circles. The third and last variant shows an egret that is only sketchily painted and almost unrecognizable. The Lurie collection includes six cracked plates bearing the Egret mark. Due to time constraints, I will only be able to show you three of them. The first is one of two examples with landscape or naturalistic scenes and 10 densely decorated panels. It shows, like the other five plates, the first variant of the Egret. The other are two plates from a total of four decorated with naturalistic scenes and eight wide and narrow panels on a pale blue wash. More rarely, they are decorated with finely executed figure scenes. This one depicts Alohan, one of the senior disciplines of the Buddha. These plates on the Santos Palace saucer dish were most probably produced in the early Wanli reign. Only a few egret marked saucer dishes of small size, like these two examples from the battle collection shown here, have been recorded thus far. They show a large peony blossom on a, or a fan of feather in underglaze blue on the interior, and their undersides are covered in a monochrome blue glaze. One cannot fail to wonder if the glaze blue reverse of these saucer dishes could have been a precursor of the high quality deep blue monochrome glaze used to cover both the reverse and interior of saucer dishes with incised decoration produced in the first reign of the subsequent Qing dynasty, the Shunjo reign. Coming back to crack porcelain, the overall quality of some pieces is outstanding. This is clearly seen in this plate from the Lurie collection. The fine execution of the painting, especially the two cranes with serrated feathers in dark blue, resembles that seen on two crack plates, one shown here with panel borders bearing the egret mark. A fragment of a cracked dish or saucer dish with a related scene of cranes but encircled by a panel border was excavated at the Wayingi kiln site. Considering the high quality of the plates bearing the egret mark and the similarities between the cranes, it's impossible that this plate and those examples were all fired at this kiln. The crane scene may have been inspired by an ink cake design, such as this one from the printed manual Fang Shimopu by Fang Yuli, published in 1588. An examination of this manual reveals close similarities between some designs for ink cakes and those seen in craft porcelain. The thinness, well-defined molding and painted decoration of this cracked saucer dish, which appears to be unique, are noteworthy. The strange and fierce-looking mythical beast is unusual. While its face, bushy tail and paws appear to be of a Buddhist lion, its scaly body, mane, horn, and flames are undoubtedly of a chilin. The chilin, one of the four divine creatures, is most auspicious in Chinese mythology. The overall scene can be related to that found in trade porcelain saucer dishes of larger size with plain sides. Two such examples depicting chilin are in the Topkapi Sawai Palace, and another shown here was formerly in the Adelaide Shrine. The underside decoration of this cracked saucer dish consisting of two beach branches arranged horizontally, disregarding the molding panels, appears to be unrecorded in cracked porcelain. 
The molded body of this cracked ball is so incredibly thin that it is translucent. One can clearly see the delicate painted decoration on the interior, and this adds a special, unique interest to this piece. Cracked porcelains of such exceptional high quality are extremely rare. Seems clear that both its fragility and beauty were taken into consideration when silver gill mounts were added to it in the Dutch Republic in circa 1640. A crack ball of similar shape, size, and depth, but painted with a continuous landscape and fitted with silver mounts, still retains its leather carrying case meant especially for it, attesting to the high appreciation of this type of ball in Europe at the time. This small crack stem cup appears to be a unique example of its type. Stem cups of small size with a plain round ball were produced in the one Lee reign for the domestic market and used to serve an alcoholic spirit, possibly wine made from fermented rice. Some of them bear an apocryphal Chenois reign mark, as porcelains from this reign were highly prized and imitated during the one Lee reign. This cracks stem cup bears such a mark. Crack candies of this refined shape and outstanding quality are extremely rare. It appears that only one other example of this lobe shape has been recorded. This candid, fitted with early 17th century German silver mounts, has the same blue castellated band on the mouth rim. As you can see, the painted decoration of the Lurie collection candy is more complex than that of the other example. The crane with dark blue serrate feathers on one of the panels resembled those seen in the crack plate we saw earlier, and in the two crack plates bearing the egg red mark. Considering the fragment of a high quality crack saucer dish with cranes excavated at the Wyinga kiln I showed you earlier, it seems possible that these candies were also fired at this kiln. Visual sources attest to the presence of crack candy of this shape and high quality in the Dutch Republic in the early decades of the 17th century. One appears in a number of paintings by Jan Brugger the Elder, dating between 1605 and 1615, but it is always depicted without the bulbous spout. Okay. Um. In the Ming Dynasty, blue and white water droppers of small size and imaginary two shapes were made for functional use on the scholar's desk. They were intended for grinding ink into liquid form for painting and calligraphy. Although this pitch-shaped water dropper does not have molded panels on its body, it relates to a group of crack pomegranate-shaped ewers, like the finely decorated examples shown here. It has the same unique feature of the curved spout, although shorter, attached with leafy branches in high relief. The pitch shape opening on its top is identical to that seen in two blue and white water droppers modeled in the shape of an aubergine. One example in the Percival David collection housed in the British Museum is finely painted with a cock and a hen in a landscape. The blue dots on the stem of the aubergine and the neck of the wings of the hen resemble those that highlight the tip of this pitch shaped water dropper. The other example recovered from the shipwreck of the Spanish Galleon San Diego, which sank in 1600, has a lizard molded in high relief on the top. This latter example demonstrates that such blue and white water droppers made during the one Lee reign were traded by the Europeans. It remains unclear if it was being imported as cargo or brought as a private consignment into the Spanish colonies in the New World. In any case, it seems likely that the customer for whom it was intended would not have understood its functional use. No other examples of this type of crack saucer dish appear to have been recorded. It relates to crack plates and saucer dishes decorated with pomegranate shaped panels with the fruit splitting open and exposing its seeds, symbolizing fertility. Crack saucer dishes of this type are rare, and the known examples are generally of good quality. Thus far, the earliest archaeological evidence of the trade of such saucer dishes to Europe is provided by the Portuguese now Nossa Senhora dos Mártires, which sunk near Lisbon in 1606. 
An example depicted in this still life painting dated 1651 attests to the presence of saucer dishes of this type in the Dutch Republic in the mid 17th century and indicate that they were also appreciated there. However, this apparently unique saucer dish is larger than those and its decoration is much more complex. It harmoniously combines motifs from different types of, that are common on crack dishes, saucer dishes and plates produced in the Wan Li and Tian Chi reigns. For instance, the central motif, a bowl filled with precious objects supported on a stand of roots, is found on large crack dishes with panel borders. The highly stylized pomegranate and its shaped panels reserve on a plain white background as if they were floating in a similar way to the bracket low panels of high quality dishes like the examples shown here is a feature rarely found in cracked porcelain. This saucer dish also relates to a group of cracked pear shaped and double board bottles with pomegranate shaped panels facing up and down which were exported to the Middle East and Europe. Such a bottle, fitted with a silver gill base depicted in a Dutch still life painting dated 1601, demonstrates that this type of cracked bottle was imported into the Dutch Republic in the first decade of the 17th century. Cracked jars of this large size and magnificent quality are extremely rare. The finely executed scenes of various animals standing below a tree are particularly noteworthy. They may have been inspired by ink cake designs from printed manuals such as Fan Shimoku published in 1588. This jar relates to another cracked jar recovered from the Spanish shipwreck San Diego. Considering the high quality of the decoration of both jars, their similarities and the fact that they are the same size, it seems reasonable to believe that this example was produced in circa 1590-1600. A painting by Varen van der Meer depicts a large crack with a similar decorative arrangement to that seen in this jar. Although it has a simpler panel decoration, it clearly shows that crack jars of this type were imported into the Dutch Republic and that they continue to be prized in the second half of the 17th century. Crack porcelain decorated with Chinese poems or inscriptions is extremely rare. To find two poems and two sentences filling the entire surface of the central medallion of a dish is even rarer. This apparently unique cracked dish has a square seal mark encircled by two poems with the characters written anti-clockwise and spiraling down the center. The first poem is by Chen Hao, a famous Confucian scholar in the Northern Sun Dynasty, and the second by a Tang Dynasty poem na poet named Li She. It is worth noting that the porcelain painted does not transcribe the second poem by Li She accurately. After the poems, the last two sentences read, exquisitely made in the second month of autumn in the Chenhua period of the Great Ming Dynasty, an antique beautiful vessel for the rich and honorable inscribed with ancient poems and bringing everlasting spring. To the best of my knowledge, this largest is the only cracked porcelain with this particular decoration. The arrangement of two poems spiraling down to the center is reminiscent of that seen on a tomb epitaph by Wu Hao Shi, dated to 1596. It is painted with the characters written anti-clockwise from the ring to the center. Gu Hao Shi was the brother of a renowned porcelain master of the Longqing and Wanli reigns. A similar arrangement, but with a poem written in concentric circles, is seen on a design from an ink cake from the 1588 Fam Shimopu. By virtue of the fact that the painter stated that this crack dish was inscribed with ancient poems and bringing everlasting spring, one must consider the possibility that it was made as a special order for the domestic market, where the poems and wishes of longevity could have been had could have had meaning rather than for export. Apart from this dish, there is a cracked dish of smaller size from the Anders Foundation now on loan to the Groninger Museum that bears a 10 character inscription to the left of the peony flowers in the center, which as noted by Professor Dr. Christian York, subtly relate to the flowers and compare them to the traditional Chinese gentlemanly virtue of modesty. 
There is also a large boat in the Van Diepen collection and a shark from a dish recovered from the Wanli shipwreck that bear inscriptions from the Ode of the Red Cliffs by Su Xi. The Wanli shipwreck dish demonstrates that at least a few inscribed cracked porcelains were exported. Crack dishes with a typical panel border of large size as well as Klapmutsen were much appreciated by the nobility and rich merchant class of the southern Netherlands, then ruled by Spain. They appear in this painting depicting the visit of Alexander the Great to the art studio of Appels in Antwerp, which served to illustrate how deeply Chinese blue and white porcelain had infiltrated the daily life in about 1630. On the right, a lady holds up a blue and white board in her hand, admiring the translucence and beauty of the porcelain. The lady kneels beside a wooden cabinet with several pieces of blue and white porcelain kept on the shelves. She places five pieces on the floor beside her, which appear to be all crack, including a large club moods and a dish, most probably to show them to the other visitors. They who have served not only to display Appel's wealth, but also his knowledge of China and his luxury goods importing into Antwerp. Cracked saucer dishes decorated with an all over motif of a dragon in pursuit of a flaming pearl are extremely rare. The dragon, one of the four divine creatures, became a popular motif using ceramics in the Tang Dynasty and continued to be regularly used on imperial ceramics in the Yuan and Ming dynasties. The quality of the decoration of this large saucer dish is outstanding. The sole motif of four floor dragon with a long snake like and scaly body is depicted in such a naturalistic way that it appears to be moving amid clouds towards the viewer. This depiction of the dragon is reminiscent of that seen on a five floor dragon designed for an ink cake published in the 1588 Fang Shimo Pu. This folklore dragon motif is also found on a few crack dishes with a molded panel border of the same large size. There are only slight variations, so it seems likely that the porcelain painter used the same source of inspiration. Moreover, they might have been part of the production of the same painter. It is worth noting that the sketchily painted decoration of the underside of this crack saucer dish consisting of two thorny branches pendant from the rim is most unusual. This small clapmutsen belonged to an extremely rare group of cracked porcelains decorated with underglazed cobalt blue and ac accents of underglazed copper red. Their shape is unusual for a clap clapmuts with taller sides terminating in a narrow upturned black low rim. No clapmutsen of this type have been found in datable archaeological excavations, and therefore it is difficult to date them with certainty. Considering the porcelains with underglazed blue and access of underglazed red produced for the Japanese market in the Tianqi and Chongyun reigns, it seems reasonable to believe that clapmutsen of this type were also produced at this time. The overall quality of these large crab moods is outstanding. The depiction of the two cranes with dark blue serrated feathers somewhat resembles that of those seen in the crack place I discussed earlier. Its complex rim border is configured by three different motifs arranged on opposing sides. The two fierce looking monster masks are striking and the motif of a crane flying among ruy clouds repeated four times is most unusual. Shards of gravels that appear to have been of this size were excavated at the third middle school kiln site. The monster masks are not visible, but we can observe that they alternate with white and blue peony scrolls, like those seen in this large and finely decorated clouds in the Prince Hope Museum in Leo Warden. Thus, it seems likely that at least some of the cracked clouds of this type and high quality were produced at this kiln. Only a very small part of the crack production was made to order for the European market. Extant pieces together with textual and visual sources indicate that at least three new crack shapes were made to order during the Tianqi and Chongyun reigns. 
One is a box of cylindrical shape with a cut-out aperture on the inner rim and a dome perforated lid with two protruding areas to fit inside the inner rim of the box to secure it in place. The Luri collection includes one of only two examples recorded thus far. The shape was probably copied from a pewter earthenware or wooden model, which in turn copied a Spanish or Dutch silver model. Silver cover boxes of similar shape were already used by the Spanish in the early 1620s, as evidenced by an example recovered from the shipwreck Nostra Señora de Atocha, which sunk in 1622. This shape, but slightly more elongated, continued to appear in Spanish silver in the following decades, as seen in this example, dating to circa 1650. This crack cover box is almost identical in shape to that of silver models depicted in still life painting by Dutch and Flemish artists about this time. One is shown alongside a crack dish in this Dutch painting dated 1658. Another appears in a few paintings by an artist active in Antwerp in the 1650s. The function of these silver boxes is still unclear. The fact that both paintings depict one such silver box alongside oysters and a partly peeled citrus fruit is intriguing. One wonders if they were used to contain salt or spices for the oysters or sugar to sweeten the citrus fruits. Considering the large amount of salt, spices or sugar dispensed from the perforated lid when shaken on top of the food, the latter seems more plausible. This type of crack box was most probably made to order for the Dutch market in the Chungjian reign. This dish is a rare example of cracked porcelain decorated with a scene of children at play. Here, two boys are shown amusing themselves with a hobby horse riding game. Scenes of boys playing with this popular children's toy appear as part of the decorative theme known as 100 children in blue eye white porcelain produced for the imperial court during the reign of Emperor Jajin. Images of boys riding a hobby horse serve as a visual metaphor for a successful scholar official who rides a horde and is accompanied by an attendant on foot who calls a canopy can over him. The scene depicted on this dish was probably taken from a printed manual that supplied in cake designs, such as the 1588 Fang Xing of Wu. Visual sources attest to the presence of dishes with this distinctive decoration, combining the typical crack panel bordered with tulip-like flowers and narrative scenes in the transitional style in the Dutch Republic in the mid 17th century. Two examples are clearly seen in this group portrait dated 1656. European coat of arms, most probably adapted or copied from drawing or prints, were depicted on a new range of cracked porcelain shapes. Pseudo-armorials were also copied onto cracked porcelain, and emblems or monograms of the Catholic Church were copied onto cracked or ordinary trade porcelain of both open and closed shapes. The majority were made to order for the Portuguese market, the earliest dating to the one reign. Thus far, only two crack armorial pieces for other European markets have been recorded. One is a thinly potted plate dating to the Wan Li reign that is of particular historical importance. It is the only known porcelain made to order for the Spanish market in the 16th century. In addition, it appears to be a unique example of crack porcelain bearing an imperial coat of arms of a European nobleman and his wife which are those of Garcia Hurtado de Mendoza, four Marquis of Cañete, and Teresa de Castro de la Cueva. Moreover, no porcelain without a memorial of a Spanish individual or an impaled coat of arms from the 17th century has been recorded thus far. This crack plate appears to be closely tied to the political history of the Viceroyalty of Peru. In 1590, Garcia Hurtado de Mendoza, a member of the richest noble family in Spain and a close friend of King Philip II, returned to the New World as the eighth viceroy of Peru. He was the first viceroy to bring his wife to Peru. An arch was erected from the, for the entry ceremony of the new viceroy. It displayed the king's coat of arms flanked by those of Lima. 
two emblems hung from a tree, one containing the impaled coat of arms of the Viceroy and Viceroyne, the other that of Lima, which represented the symbolic union of the capital with the new rollage of the kingdom. Textual sources inform us that Garcia Hurtado de Mendoza, taking advantage of his privileged position, was actively involved in ordering Chinese goods via Manila as early as 1592. In April of that year, he sent a letter to the King's secretary, justifying himself for bringing goods for the Spanish Philippines, saying, I really did it more for bringing some curious and showy things for the service of my house than for greed. Exactly two years later, in April 9, 1594, the viceroy sent another letter informing the king that he had sent another 8,000 ducats to China for some gifts and tasteful things for the Marquis. Although these extracts do not provide textual evidence of a specific order of a porcelain plate with the impaled arms of the viceroy and viceroy, it seems likely that this crack plate was ordered via Manila during the time Octavo de Mendoza was Viceroy of Peru between 1590 and June 1596. It relates closely in shape and high quality to two crack armorial plates made to order for the Portuguese market bearing the coat of arms of the Almeida or Melo family and two others the coat of arms attributed to the Cordero or Cordero family all dating to circa 1590-1600. The other crack armorial was made to order for the Yanmar market in the subsequent race of Tianqi or Chongzhen. It is a large dish now in the Residence Museum in Munich, bearing at the center the quarter arms of Villespach surrounded by the color of the golden fleece within a panel border. It is likely that it was made for Maximilian I, Duke of Bavaria and Prince Elector of the Holy Roman Empire around 1625-1635. The extant circumstances of this order are unknown. The order could have been made via Macau or via Manila, but in all probability was made exploiting dynastic relations with the Habsburgs. These crack sausage dishes bearing a southern memorial are extremely rare. Only three saucer dishes of this type, size and decoration have been recorded thus far and all date to the Wanli reign. Furthermore, this Sudra memorial is one of only two known in cracked porcelain. The source of this Sudra memorial, depicted as a water fountain within a cartouche-like shield is still unknown. Interestingly, the water fountain motif somewhat resembles that seen on a small number of blue and white ewers of Middle Eastern metal form and on bottle buses, most probably depicting a Renaissance bronze fountain known as the Magic Fountain, all dating to the judging reign. These three examples belong to the group of cracked saucer dishes we saw earlier, generally of good quality, would have the pomegranate shaped panels naturalistically painted in global blue. Crack saucer dishes with various other molded designs laid plain white are known to have been fired in at least three kilns, Shibakiao, Wainge, and Third Middle School. These kilns all produce some high quality porcelains, so it seems likely that saucer dishes like these examples were fired at least in one of them. Emblems or monograms of the Catholic Church were copied onto crack or ordinary tray blue porcelain. This blue and white trade dish included in this section because it relates closely to a small group of jars and trade porcelain dishes made to order with the emblem of the mendicant order of San Agustin, the double-headed eagle. Eight crack jars of large ovoid form, including the example shown here in the Peterborough in the Essex Museums in Salem, and another of large hexagonal shape, as well as two hexagonal jars of smaller size, unknown with palace enclosing the Augustinian emblem, an architectural motif of unknown origin. The Peabody Essex also houses one of only two known large tray blue and white dishes wearing the Augustinian emblem at the center. The architectural motif on its borders, repeated twice, is like that seen on this tray dish. Only a few such tray dishes of small size, painted at the center with confronting lions, have been recorded. With no textual or archaeological evidence, it remains unclear for whom and 
by whom and when exactly these pieces were ordered. Probably Portuguese or Spanish friars ordered those bearing the Augustinian emblem for use at their churches and convents in Macau, the Philippines, or New Spain. It seems possible that the trade dishes such as this example, omitting the emblem, would also have been ordered for the Augustinians. After about 1630, a distinct new type of porcelain of extraordinarily high quality, which Sir Michael Battle was the first to classify under the term high transitional, was produced at Jindigen. It was made with a fine white porcelain clay, was superbly potted and mostly decorated with a brilliant underglaze cobalt blue. More rarely, it was decorated with polychrome overglazed enamels. It was mostly intended for the literati gentry or official class with gold china under the emperor and the new wealthy merchants who emulated the lifestyles. This porcelain showing new decorative themes reflected the critical, ethical and political concerns of the literati at this time. Until now, Jindagen archaeologists have discovered only one kiln where high transitional porcelain was fired, Shibakiao. High transitional blue and white porcelains of very high quality were also produced for the European market from the early 1630s. Some of them were made specially for the Dutch market. The most recognizable feature are the narrative scenes based on, based on woodcloth print illustrations of classical dramas, novels, and legendary stories depicted with tiny V-shaped ticks for grass vertical ledger rocks in various shades of blue, giving the illusion of depth, and swirling clouds linking the beginning and end of the scene. This feature was most probably inspired by prints like those included in collected illustrations of the three realms, first printed in 1609, which is regarded as the earliest illustrated encyclopedia printed in China or included in an album of Tang poetry and paintings published during the Wanli and Tianqi reigns. Transitional bodies like this example with a bulge at the upper end of the neck beautifully combine elements from three different and distant cultures, Islamic, Chinese, and European. While the shape is Islamic, the narrative scenes are based on classical Chinese dramas, novels, or stories and the tulip-like flowers are based on drawings, prints, or wall types the, the built, depicting such flowers, which were introduced to China by the Dutch to be copied on the porcelain made to order for them. The presence of high transitional bottles of this shape and related decoration in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century is attested by the examples depicted in a few still-like paintings by the Dutch artist William Koff. This one feature, as well as the tanka, master pot, and candlestick I will show you in a few minutes, belong to a group of transitional style porcelain made to order after European models. Salt clay stoneware wine pitchers of related shape and similar size were produced in the an area that is now Belgium in the late 16th century. The distinctive motif of whimsical green chiros only occur in transitional style bottles and wine pitchers of this shape. In all probability, the bottles were provided with a print or drawing of wind cherubs to be copied on the porcelain, but textual sources consulted thus far have not yet revealed who sent it and what exactly was its purpose. The potters used the same type of loop handle with a curved point and filium on transitional style tankas with a tall body, which were imported into the Dutch Republic in the late 1630s. Archaeological finds at Jindigen have shown that such tankards were fired at the Shiva Kiao Kiln. As you can see, the decoration of this tankard is arranged in horizontal bands, similar to that of the wine pitcher I just showed you. It is clear that such porcelain tankas were greatly appreciated at the time as they appear alongside other imported or local objects in still life painting, such as these examples by William Clive's Edda, dated 1688. This painting is of particular interest as it also depicts a jar similar to two examples in the Sika collection with a decoration that resembles the gold decorative bands of contemporary European silver. 
and a large bowl bearing the other Sudan memorial recorded so far in cracked porcelain. It is depicted as a shield enclosing an extraordinary hydra with five animal heads and one head of a man and a woman flanked by a scroll inscribed with a Latin motto to the wise man nothing is new, which appears in combination with Buddhist auspicious symbols. No source of this pseudomorial has yet been identified. The shape of these transitional master pots fitted with hinged Dutch silver mount is a faithful copy of a contemporary Dutch model made in tin or pewter. From an answer to a letter sent from Batavia to Taoyuan, the DOC settlement in Formosa, we learned that models of master or water pots made of churn wood were first given to Chinese merchants to be copied in porcelain in July 1635 the models of master pots were again provided in 1638. Transitional style master pots of this global shape are usually decorated with river landscapes or narrative scenes, as seen in this example shown on the left. More rarely, they show a combination of Chinese and European motifs, such as the phoenix rondels alternating with stylized tulip like flowers, seen in the example on the right. The hollow finial of the lid served to hold a long handled spoon, just as in the metal or ceramic originals. The shape of this transitional style candlestick is derived from Dutch silver or pewter models, which, made in various sizes, were commonly used in the Dutch Republic in the late 16th century. Models of candlesticks were also sent by DOC servants to Jindagen to be copied in porcelain in July 1635, and additional models were sent in 1638 and 1639. Transitional style candlesticks of this shape show slight variations. They may have a, a tall hollow stem, as seen here, or a short stem to hold the candle. The candlesticks of larger size are usually finely decorated with a combination of Chinese and European motifs, as in the master pot I just showed you. Various narrative scenes are painted on the hollow high bell foot and stylized tulips and other flowers on the tall stem and ring pan. In the Tianqi reign, the Jindijian potters were able for the first time to produce a new type of Luan white porcelain specifically to the taste of the Japanese, known since the 19th century as Kosometsuke, literally meaning all blue and white. Kosometsuke porcelains produce in large quantities in a wide variety of new and unusual shapes to suit specific functions, decorated in a free, a seemingly careless manner, and the liberty made with imperfections and irregularities responded to the Japanese demand for wares intended for the tea ceremony and the kaiseki, a light meal that preceded the serving of thick tea during the tea ceremony. This was alien to Chinese ceramic aesthetics. Kosometsuke porcelains were decorated solely in underglaze blue or in a combination of underglaze blue and red. Sir Michael Butler assembled an extensive room of Kosometsuke and Koakai porcelains. The quality and variety of shapes and decorative subjects of the pieces, which have most distinct and attractive spontaneity, is rarely found outside Japan. Excavations conducted since 2001 in the old city zone in Jindagen have shown that at least six private kilns fired Kosometsuke porcelain alongside porcelain for the domestic and export markets, including crack and the so-called transitional. For instance, Kosometsuke saucer dishes dating to the Tianchi reign decorated with a hair, a two-character inscription meaning jade hair, and blotches of paint scattered around the body, executed in the blown-in technique which developed in this reign, were fired at the fifth primary school kiln. Although incense burdens were not commonly used in the tea ceremony, a few Kosometsuki porcelain examples dating to the Tianqi reign are known. Modeled in two parts, they are usually in the shape of a Buddhist lion seated on a plinth, or more rarely in the shape of a Luduan, an auspicious unicorn standing four square. The smoke would have emerged from their open mouth, giving the impression of a real creature breathing smoke. 
The shape of the Luluan, modeled after gilt bronze incense burners produced for the imperial court in the Shonde reign, was relatively common in bronzes from the late Ming dynasty onwards. The Luri collection includes five cosmetic pieces and a small porcelain box seen on the bottom left, which share similar characteristics to cosmetic incense boxes of similar size. I will only be able to discuss briefly the rarest example, called Kogo in Japanese. Small boxes or containers such as this one could have been used to hold pieces of incense either to the charcoal in the brassiere before making the tea or be taken to the alcove for the admiration of guests. The Kogo were produced in various animal shapes, some of them as seen here, modeled as a frog molded in relief on the lid. The moth-eaten ages, called mushikui, seen in one of the frog's elbows, is due to the thick glaze applied to its body with poor levigated clay, an effect that was particularly prized in Japan. The naturalistic decoration, suggesting the frog's skin texture, relates to that seen on frog-shaped candies from a group of cracks or morphic candies, such as this example seen on the right, first produced at the five rekins in the Wanli reign for the Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern, and European markets. In the last part of the lecture, we will discuss a few pieces that were recovered from the Hatcher junk, a Chinese junk laden with a large shipment of porcelain that sank on a reef in the South China Sea in circa 1643, presumably on its way to the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company or VOC in Batavia. On arrival, the cargo would have been divided into small lots, the majority destined for various Asian markets and only a small number for the European market, more specifically for the Dutch market. The excavations carried out by Captain Michael Hatcher in the 1980s yielded a total of about 25,000 intact porcelain pieces produced in the last years of the Ming dynasty which were in the remarkably good condition after having been submerged in the sea for approximately 340 years. The porcelain, varying considerably in quality, consisted of diverse types, a few never seen before and others well known, as seen in these examples from the bottom collection. These included crack, transitional, cobalt blue monochromes, blanc de chine porcelain from the Hua, as well as pieces made to order after European models. The Lurie collection includes 17 thinly potted blue and white small cups of this shape and decoration, which probably would have been used for the consumption of an alcoholic beverage in the Dutch Republic. Brandy wine cups were first mentioned in the Ville of Ladig of the VOC ship Blissingen in 1612. Two octagonal bowls, one seen here, belong to a type of porcelain with an extremely fine technique of reticulation in imitation of carved chase, known as linglong or devil's work, which had a long tradition in China. Linglong porcelain appears to have been popular in the Dutch Republic in the mid 1630s. From a letter sent in June 1634 from Batavia to Zhao Taoyuan, we learned of a request for high quality porcelain, which included see-through or cut-through porcelain. It seems likely that the Ling Long bowls, like these two examples from the Lurie collection, were not only admired in Europe for the virtuosity of their delicate pierce and under glaze cobalt blue decoration, but also for the fact that when placed on a surface that received direct natural sunlight or candlelight, they projected a beautiful and curious shadow. The cargo yielded only five bolts with an upright pointing spout, stout shaped candle, and three pierced lion masks applied in high relief. Their decoration shows some variations. This pot and another example are decorated with an overall design of fruity melon vine. Two other examples, one in the bottle collection and the other um, shown here, uh, that was among the hatcher pieces stored at the Christie's warehouse in Amsterdam ready for action, are decorated with flowers growing from rotwork, interrupted by three Buddhist lions with upright bodies. In addition to the hatchet junk pots, a few other examples of this type have been recorded. St. Michael Butler used to call them peace pots, 
Such ports were not only used for urine, but also for water in both the VOC trading factory in Batavia and the Dutch Republic, as attested by the 51 urine or water ports listed in 1637 in the Bill of Lading of the Amsterdam that sailed from Formosa to Batavia and the 55 urine or water ports in the bit of lading of the Breda among the porcelain shipped to the Dutch Republic. We now know that ports of these types were fired at the Lumakiao kiln, where shards of an example decorated with a dense design of flower scrolls, similar to the fifth pot of this type recovered from the hatchet junk were recently excavated. To conclude, I just want to show you a group portrait dated 1654, which depicts a bourgeois family in a room of a home with a few pieces of blue and white porcelain. It serves to illustrate that by this time, the formal arrangements of porcelain adopted for interior decoration in the Dutch Republic included pieces of both crack and transitional style porcelain. The crack bowl on top of the bed frame is similar to examples recovered from the hatcher junk a type that was first produced in the Wanli reign with well-defined molded panels and finally executed decorations such as this example from the Lurie collection and another with English silver gilt mounts found in Burley House, a large manor house in South Lincolnshire, England. This latter bowl traditionally believed to have been a gift from Queen Elizabeth I to her godchild Thomas Walsingham, a cousin of the Queen's minister, Sir Francis Walsingham, is known as the Walsingham Bowl. The two transitional style ovoid covered jars displayed at either side of a large crack dish on top of the lintel above the door and one other on top of the bed frame are similar to these two hatcher junk examples. They show a new decorative arrangement of flowers place and leafy branches on a plain white background as if floating on air. Woodwork print illustrations of branches of different blossoming flowers sparsely arranged in a plain background, included in the 1588 manual Fang Shimopu, may have served as inspiration for this distinctive type of decoration. The porcelain recovered from the hatcher junk proves that until the final years of the Ming dynasty, the ginger gem potters and painters were creating new shapes and decorative styles of porcelain. Although the civil wars and subsequent collapse of the Ming dynasty disrupted the porcelain production, the pieces discussed in this lecture give tangible testimony to the great technical achievements, creativity, and capacity to adapt to constantly changing requirements of the potters who work at the private kilns from the Wanli to Chungjin reigns. Moreover, the pieces especially made to order after European shapes or with European motifs provide evidence of the fascinating cultural and artistic exchanges that occur between the Chinese and Europeans during this period. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kanapa, for giving us a comprehensive um, introduction on the main types of export porcelain produced in Jingdezhen from the late Ming Dynasty, and also telling us the commercial, cultural, and artist, artist uh, artistic interactions behind. And now uh, we are open for discussions and uh, questions. Please feel free to let us know your thoughts, comments, and questions. Uh, and while um, the audience is like thinking of their um, questions, uh, I would like to ask like a, a very basic but very big question that um, actually we're always feeling that the crack, uh, crack puzzling is very eye-catching with this very impressive um, style and patterns. Uh, actually, as Dr. Kanapa has explained to us, there's many cultural and uh, like uh, our artistic um, like uh, taste behind it. And uh, could you exp like uh, explore or tell us more like about the the culturals or the like uh, artistic taste behind the crack porcelain or like uh, what has expired? the like occurring of the, 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 the appearance of the crack porcelain and why it was so popular like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, 
Well, as you as you saw in in the lecture, the variety of motifs, shapes uh, in cracked porcelain is enormous, and um, it also evolved from the beginning um, to in the seventy or so years of production, which is natural. Initially, I would say that uh, cracked porcelain combined um, floral elements from one leaf pieces um, and 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 porcelains that were made for the domestic market. Now, the panel border is a question that um, many people has explored. We know that um, some pieces with panel borders were um, imported into Europe in the mid 16th century. And um, particularly, we have examples that were in, in the cargo of the Espadarte the earliest Portuguese shipwreck ever found uh, with porcelain, which sank in 1558. So just one year after the establishment of the Portuguese in Macau. But this, this piece is not cracked. This piece is not molded, but it has the panel borders. Prior to that, we know that in the Yuan dynasty, there were panel, panel designs and Ultimately, people always relate this with, um, with porcelains uh, from Iran, for example, well, but not porcelains from, you know, ceramics from Iran, which had panel borders. It is a difficult question to point to decide from where, but in my point of view, craft porcelain combined several different stylistic um, attributes from different ceramics, uh, Chinese and foreign. Uh, what I think is um, that they discovered that this type of porcelain, uh, that it was molded uh, on the rims, would facilitate the porcelain decorators to paint. Uh, so it will to speed up the process of, of the production. Because if you have the molded panels, it's very easy to then fill in the, the panels within different, with different designs. And we see in the majority of the pieces that the designs are not complex. For example, in this one we are seeing here, uh, the, the, there are flowers and there are um, you know, peaches and, and leaves that's not complicated. Obviously, there are others that are much more complex. But in, in general, I think that facilitated the production. Now, I made the point about the, the Spanish trade route because I think the demand increased enormously. So we have one of the earliest um, ships, um, textile sources indicate that it carried about 22,000 pieces of porcelain. I mean, that is an enormous quantity. We, for example, in the in the Espadarte in 1558, uh, only a thousand pieces were recovered. But of course, many more could have been there because it was a subject of theft many times uh, before it was excavated. We know that in the late 1570s, enormous quantities were were on, on board of the of the they used to call the San Felipe now the Baja California shipwreck. Although we have never found a shipwreck, we know that many, many um, porcelains of various types were included in that cargo. Uh, so I think that demand um, led the, the potters and painters to produce, first of all, thin porcelain to, to reduce the quantity of material used. So in, a, in an economic um, sense, uh, then to have the molding, which would facilitate and speed up the process of painting. And then this, this, they discovered that this panel border was very attractive and people really liked it. And we, we have seen, for example, only a few or a small number of crack pieces that are decorated with scenes taken from, from printed sources, Chinese printed sources, like wood, woodwork print uh, books. But the majority are naturalistic, are natural scenes, um, which they were inspired by these books, but they were not copied exactly from these books. And then you have the Portuguese demand for um, armorial 
pieces, which already they had done in the judging reign. Um, they began ordering these pieces, but in much larger quantity during the Wanli reign and onwards. And uh, as I said, we only have two that are not made for the Portuguese, one for the Spanish and one for the German market. But obviously the Portuguese were the ones that had closer access to, to the porters and had been longer in, in Asia and, and, and had this already these commercial ties with the people in Jindajan. So it was easier for them to order this type of pieces. But it's fascinating. I mean, I, I think cracked porcelain is one of the most interesting porcelains um, ever made in export porcelains ever made in Jindajan. And, and it's very important to think that this is the, for the first time this porcelain was exported all over the world. So it's the first type of gingergen porcelain being exported around and, and um, valued by so many different societies around the world. Thank you so much for your detailed explanation. And uh, we still have other questions, so um, we can like go through the questions from now. And the first, uh, the first question is about your um, books. <laughs> uh, like uh, Julian is asking that, um, thank you for this very interesting talk and where can we buy your books? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, the distribution in Asia is, um, is, is complex, it's not so easy. But I think, I'm not sure, um, I think there is some, the equivalent of Amazon in China yeah and um, i know that my first book so silk porcelain and lacquer was offered there and uh, because i know somebody wrote to me that had bought it from from that um you know platform i don't know um so but if you if you um if you access um amazon maybe or 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 that i i, I don't really know exactly where you can find them from. But we are working on that for, for this new book, Leaping the Dragon Gate. We are trying to find a good distributor in, in China that would obviously distribute throughout um, Asia. So, so that question can be answered later, uh, but I, I, I don't know exactly how, how to do it. Okay, thank you. If we have um, have more news, maybe we can share with um, our audience and we look forward yes. to your new your books. Yeah. Uh, and another question is, was there different national tastes among European countries, for example, in terms of decorative motif they like, or can we consider European taste as a whole? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I would say that um, because I, I studied uh, for my PhD, the trade of the, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch and the English, and they pretty much uh, imported the same types of porcelain with the difference of the armorial porcelain, obviously, but, but uh, pretty much they all have sort of the same types. And, but we, we must remember that initially the Europeans would buy whatever was available for them to purchase and then take to Europe and then the Spanish to the new world. Um, for example, one, one interesting fact is the majority of the porcelain um, traded by all the Europeans, um, it was from Jinjijang. Only a small quantity was from the Hua or from Janjo in Fujian province. But the, the, the great majority was from Jinjijang and then the great majority was decorated in underglazed blue. Thank you. And the next question is, um, thank you for the great talk, Dr. Kanapa. I find it hard to recon uh, reconcile the fact that the quality of this export were varied so widely. In particular, would you see that the treat ceramics featured in contemporary oil paintings are of the absolute top quality? Uh, you, seem, you seem to have a number of rare and extraordinary pieces, but they are not illustrated in paintings. Why is that? Is it um, conceivable that some of these top pieces were exported or collected decades after they were made? or even a century after that? 
Well, um, well, the 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 quality of the pieces varies greatly, and in the in the shipwrecks, the, the Portuguese and the Spanish shipwrecks, you will find from very very good quality pieces to actually very bad quality pieces. I'm talking about cracked porcelain in, in this case, and and uh, these these what what this tells us is that there were different markets. So there was the elite market, which would have been able to acquire them the best quality pieces and therefore more expensive pieces, but also the sort of the lower classes, um, which would have been happy to have a piece which was not of very good quality because they had never seen anything better than that. We can't forget that porcelain was much better than earthenware or tin plates, which was the, the typical tableware that they were using. And also porcelain, we're talking about the, the late Ming dynasty, which corresponds in, in, to the um, so from the late uh, from the late 16th century to the mid 17th century. So we have um, the majority of the piece, the people. Um, that never seen porcelain before, the majority of the population, and that they, they would emulate the people who had porcelain or wanted to acquire these foreign objects and admire them very much. That's why you have um, the Netherlands and, and Portugal copying the designs or trying to emulate the whiteness of the porcelain because people wanted these op foreign objects. And, and I think I think what I show you today only there are a few images of paintings. There are many, many more. And some of those paintings don't illustrate the best, best quality pieces. So you 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 can see that um, that all sort of pieces were depicted, and they were depicted in in different ways. So initially they were all still lives, and then you have some family portraits, the ones that I show you that include um, porcelain in the decoration of the room. Uh, so porcelain was used, but also then later on, particularly in the Netherlands, was used as, as a decoration of the rooms. And, and that, that came to be when they have much more access to porcelain in quantities I'm talking about. So initially it was like a precious object and then it became to become more and more common and obviously go down the social scale. But always it was, in this period I'm talking about, it was a reflection of wealth, of knowledge of foreign countries. So it was important to display it as well. Yeah, thank you. I think um, uh, the audience has uh, an audition. Like, um, so do we know if like uh, 18th or 19th century Europeans collected late Ming porcelains? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, we know we know that um, that some some collections uh, began earlier than that in the late 16th century and early 17th century. But I I think um, people have admired and collected uh, late Ming porcelain uh, all the time. Now, not necessarily export porcelain, because I think the interest in export porcelain. Is, is somewhat newer of the 20th century. Initially, people wanted more imperial porcelain or porcelain made for the Chinese domestic market. So I, I think for sure some people must have collected. We know, uh, for example, in England, they, they, the many manor houses have collections of um, blonde chine porcelain of the early 18th century. So, so it, yes, they did collect. I, I'm not sure exactly which types they collected, but we know, at, at least in, in England, we know of many manor houses collecting um, um, main porcelains. Thank you. And we still have another question. It's also a very challenging question that, um, what would be the most cure, uh, accurate de definition of trackware by art historians? Oh. Blue and white porcelain modeled mostly for export, panel border in case of saucer plate, 
uh, produced in a certain period under the Ming Dynasty, like a lot of different elements? Or should we look at the quality more than at the shape or the destination? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that's a difficult question. Well, I, I think if you were going to define cracked porcelain, um, I'm talking about the general cracked porcelain because as I, the, the, the majority of the pieces I show you today are of very, very high quality and they are rare. The majority is good to medium quality, the majority of cracked porcelain. But I would say that it was a type of porcelain that was produced with um, poorly levigated clay. Therefore, it had imperfections. Uh, they, they, the clays did not adhere well to the, to the body. Therefore, you have uh, some, some um, uh, chips on the rim and you, know, you, you have these particular characteristics of uh, like the Japanese called mushikui. Uh, you have this parts of the rims that and the edges that are not covered with glaze. Um, I would say that yes, the molding, the molding and the paneling is uh, definitely a characteristic that many people uh, identify immediately crack porcelain with that. I would say naturalistic and, um, and, um, and um, also some figurative scenes uh, in the main um, cent center of a dish, for example. And I, I would say that it has a, uh, it's a porcelain type that has a lot of dynamic in the designs. So even though you have repeated panels, um, they, they create a rhythm. So they, they is um, a lot of, um, it, it attracts attention, this, this type of porcelain. But I, I would say in terms of shapes, the shapes are very varied. Um, from you have the plates like the plates of, 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 the, of the armorial, um, dishes of that little bowl I show you that is translucent, that are very, very thin to very thick and, um, and heavy pieces, like the large dishes that are about 50 to 55 centimeters in the diameter, and they are very heavy. So you have a great variety of pieces. It's, it's, um, it's difficult to, to decide which, which attribute are you going to choose uh, to collect or to acquire these pieces. For me, is the rarity of a piece, um, or a piece that has some kind of historical importance, that it relates to a, a shipwreck, or it relates to an excavation, and, and therefore a particular kiln, or could um, give testimony of the trade, or who collected it, the Spanish, the Portuguese, or the Dutch, or the English. So it's, it has many different aspects of that one, one can see. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Scanerba. And uh, still another question. Uh, uh, another fantastic lecture, Teresa. Thank you. Please could you talk more about the export of enameled pieces? What was the scale and any evidence of the demand? Thank you. Okay, so um, there were, in terms of um, crack porcelain and high transitional porcelain that I show you today, uh, there were only a few pieces with enamels. So I show you the two dishes that are the, are the only one known in crack porcelain that are decorated only in overglazed enamels. Then you have the other few pieces that have a combination of underglazed blue and overglazed enamels, but they are very, very rare. Then you have the production of koakai pieces for the Japanese market at the end of the, of the, of, of the Ming Dynasty, which it was an explosion of color, obviously. And those were for the Japanese market. Now, with my studies of the shipwrecks, in the late 16th century, the shipwreck that sank in Baja California, the one I mentioned in the late 1570s, that shipwreck have a considerable quantity, well, the ones that have been found, obviously, the shipwreck has not been found, but the ones that have come sh to shore. It's a considerable quantity of pieces uh, with overglazed enamels. And, um, and these are typically little bowls, um, little cups. They are not big pieces with, with enamels. But I think in general, the preference was for blue and white porcelain. 
And another thing to consider when, when we um, see this porcelain from the shipwrecks, many times the, the enamels have been abraded um, or have been lost through the, the, time, the time that have been in the sea and the salt. And, and, and this sometimes is not very easy to, to determine which patterns they wear. In the case of the Baja California shipwreck, yes, you can identify. And there were many that were sort of intact. You could see perfectly well. The, the motifs, but the preference was blue and white porcelain, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Canapa. Um, we have still a few minutes left and I see someone online have raised their hands. I don't know if we can like, uh, someone is still there, <laughs> but or the question is already asked and answered, uh, I'm not sure. So if someone still have questions, please raise your hand at this moment and uh, we can still leave some time for our audience here. Is anyone have questions here? Want to ask? Yeah, yeah, if everyone is fine. So it's time to see, thank you again for uh, Dr. Kanapa. And thank you for a fantastic sharing of your knowledge. And we really enjoyed this lecture. And uh, uh, <laughs> we still have one more question. You want to answer it? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, OK, thank you. So um, this is the last question. <laughs> uh, thank you for such an in informative talk. Uh, there were two salsa dishes you shown with a still life with Roman, Roma, a Roma flute uh, in Rice Museum for the ring part of the sauces. There, there are tulip like or um, pomegranate like pattern. And uh, yeah, ah, yeah, and this have another part here. Would you mind let us know if that is actually tulips or um, pomegranate? Okay, I, I think um, the person is talking about the saucer dish I show with the pomegranates. Mm. So the pomegranates um, have the, they, they show the seeds. Yeah. Uh, the, so the seeds are painted and then what is, what is ar ar around them is actually leaves. It's not, it's not tulips. It's just a leaves, uh, like a scrolling leaves going around the pomegranates. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And they are molded and they are very, mm. very good. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And our audience, if you are st still like curious about the slides or the picture uh, Dr. Kanapa has shown, you can just um, review the videos after we upload it um, to our like Facebook, Bilibili and YouTube plat uh, platform. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Kanapa. We really enjoy your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.